a viewer has sent me their PC and so far I've taken it from this to this but it doesn't turn on. This video was brought to you by VIP SCD Key. If you head over there using my link in the description box below, you'll find they offer cheap LBM Windows 10 keys, for which you can use my discount code TPC, which gives you 25% off, bringing the price down to 16 US dollars. And once activated, you'll be able to upgrade to Windows 11 for free. They also offer Office 2019, which you'll be able to get for only 49 US dollars using my code TPC. So back to the video. So the build doesn't turn on, but that's not necessarily a big deal because nine times out of 10, when a newly constructed PC doesn't turn on, it's because you've simply done something silly, like forgotten to plug in the power cable or switch the power supply on. And it turned out that my problem here was that I had simply plugged in one of the front IO cables incorrectly. These can be fiddly and a lot of people find them difficult, but there's no harm done if you plug them in wrong and it's quickly caught and corrected. So once I'd moved the restart cable to its correct position, as Chris has a cat that likes to press the power button, and I thought making the reset button the power button would be harder for her to press, I was able to turn the system on. And we now get our first look at what the system looks like with the RGB lighting rainbowing. It's very pretty, but a new issue has presented itself. The system isn't posting. When this happens, the best thing to do is look to the motherboard for more information. With some boards, you can get a little number readout, which will give you a code that you can Google for information. But with this board, there's a series of LEDs which signify the steps during post. And it's the DRAM LED that's illuminated, which means that the issue is related to the memory. Or perhaps due to a communication issue between the memory and the memory controller on the CPU. Which is sadly a possibility due to the mishap I had removing Chris's old CPU cooler. So there are a few different ways I can tackle this, but I want to start by trying a single stick of memory in a different slot. And that posts. So I'm now going to add the second dim in slot 1, so they're running dual channel, and that doesn't post, which is not good. I already have a pretty good idea of where this is heading, but I need to rule out whether this second stick of memory is the issue, just to be sure. So I'm going to try that in the third slot on its own. And that posts, meaning neither of these dims are to blame. And whilst that's not what I wanted to see, it's exactly what I expected to see. So I've just checked the memory in a bunch of slot combinations multiple times off camera to confirm. And here's what I know so far. Slot 1 and 2 do not function, whereas slots 3 and 4 work fine. Unfortunately, this means that I'm unable to run the memory in dual channel, which is a pretty big deal. And given that the system did post in dual channel before I rebuilt it, I think it's safe to say that it's my fault. But I don't yet precisely know what's wrong. It could be the CPU, the motherboard, or both. It could also be something fixable, like a bad CPU mount, but I think that's wishful thinking at this point. So the next step is to remove the CPU cooler and take a closer look. This cooler was a lot easier to remove than Chris's deep cool one, as you can give the cooler a little twist to break the foam paste grip. And taking a closer look at the CPU, everything still looks fine. I can't see anything wrong with it, even with a magnifying glass. The socket also looks fine. So to begin with, I'm just going to reinstall the CPU to see if it just needed reseating. You never know. And trying it with memory module in slot 1, it still doesn't post. Slot 3 still works fine though, so there are no changes from before. So the next step is for me to isolate if the issue is with the 5800X CPU or with the Asus Tough motherboard. So to do this, I've grabbed a spare 3600X and installed that. And with memory module in slot 1, the system now passes the DRAM check. Of course it won't post fully as there's no GPU installed, but it gets past the DRAM check without issue. I also checked slots 2 and 4, which is how I'd run memory, and that also worked fine. And lastly, just to be 100% sure, I grabbed a kit of Corsair memory to test all the slots together, and yep, that worked fine. So it's safe to say there's nothing wrong with the memory slots or motherboard socket on this board and my issue is, as expected, with the CPU. However, even though I was certain that it was the CPU, 
I decided to try it on an Asus B550 board on my test bench, just in case. And not only did it boot with four sticks of memory, and not only did the BIOS detect all the memory modules just fine, but with XMP set, I was able to run Ada 64 with no problems for over half an hour. So at this point, we know that Chris's motherboard works fine with a different CPU, and that his CPU works fine with a different motherboard, but together it has DRAM posting issues. The 3600X and 5800X are from different generations of Ryzen CPU, so I thought perhaps there could be an issue with the motherboard that only presents itself on a Zen 3 CPU. So I got the 5900X from my game PC and gave that a try, and with all four steps of memory it worked just fine. At this point I realised that I'd skipped some of the basic troubleshooting steps you would normally take, so I thought now would be a good time to catch up on those while I had to think about what to do next. So I reunited Chris's 5800X and his tough X570 board and confirmed that it still has problems, which it does. I took the BIOS battery out for a bit to clear the CMOS, and this didn't fix the problem, and updated the BIOS from version 3602 to 4403, and this didn't fix the problem either. I then received a suggestion that it could be the new power supply or some kind of short within the installation of this new case, but I thought that was highly, highly unlikely given that both the 5900X and 3600X work fine here, but I thought I'd give it a go anyway and moved Chris's motherboard along with his 5800X to the test bench, and as expected this didn't fix the problem. So at this point I was genuinely out of ideas, like look at this chart of the main steps I've taken so far. The motherboard test point towards a perfectly working board, the CPU test point towards a perfectly working CPU, but they just don't work together for some reason. I would love to know in the comments below at this point what you would do, like would you just pick one to replace and move on? If so, which one would you pick? Is there a test that you would do that I haven't? I'd love to know. And I have to say this is probably the most confusing and frustrating issue I've ever faced. So at this point, I was ready to try something a little risky to see if it yielded any new information. So I removed the CPU cooler from the CPU. Side note, the CPU came off with the CPU cooler again, showing that the twist technique doesn't always work. There's tips to try and lower the chances of the CPU coming out, but nothing can entirely make up for AM4's poor CPU retention mechanism. Anyway, I removed the cooler from the CPU so that I could see if it posts without the cooler pressure, and with all four sticks of them reinstalled, it posted fine. I turned the system off quickly because it's not a good idea to run a CPU without a cooler, but in this case, I'd say the risk paid off because this test has revealed something interesting. So the next test, I first put the cooler back on and tightened it fully and confirmed that it had gone back to not posting if there's memory in slots 1 and 2, which it had. I then decided to incrementally loosen the cooler, testing along the way, until eventually the cooler was completely undone, and it was only once the cooler was essentially just sat on top of the CPU that the motherboard would post with all four memory modules installed. So what I know now is that if any pressure is put onto this CPU and motherboard combo, that's when the problem arises. And this got me thinking, this entire time I've been panicking because I potentially damaged a viewer's PC, which would kind of suck given that this is my first time making this type of content. But what if it had been sent to me like this? What if the reason it posted before the rebuild, but had trouble after the rebuild, is because of the different cooler? The original build used a deep cool Gamax 400, which I'd upgraded to the Noctua NHU12A, and they have entirely different mounting mechanisms. So I thought I'd try the original cooler, and wouldn't you know it, that works completely fine. And then I started thinking, when I originally tested Chris's build as it was sent to me, I experienced some instability that I planned to look into after the rebuild. But what if that instability was this same issue the entire time? What if, as I ran stress tests and the temps rose, the heat caused things to expand, which could result in a cooler mounting pressure change, which then perhaps causes a communication issue between the memory and CPU and results in the system freezing? To confirm my suspicions, I ran an ADA64 stress test, and it's worth mentioning that CPU temps were a lot lower here on an open air bench than they were before. But I stopped it after 14 minutes to move on to different tasks, and just as I stopped it, the system froze. I was going to move to Cinebench, but I didn't need to. This system is unstable as it was when I originally tested it. So where does this leave me? Whilst there's no way to know for sure, I feel pretty confident that this motherboard and CPU had this issue before I'd done anything to it. 
So I feel exonerated on that front, which is great. However, I still have a sepia and motherboard combo, which don't work together. And I don't know the exact reason why. Perhaps there's a microscopic size issue with both, and it's only when the two issues are added together that the memory issue presents itself. But Chris has been without a PC for far too long, so I think the best route forward is to just give him the AORUS board from my personal PC, because I can't afford to buy him anything new, and then get this build back to him. So I loaded my motherboard up, got it installed into the build, and at long last the rig is back together. It's looking good, although I did prefer the connector locations on the Asus board, especially for USB, as the build now has this long cable loop here, which doesn't look the best, but was unavoidable. The good news, however, is that because this board is a bit newer than the one it replaced, it now allows me to have all the front USB ports connected, and it adds other upgrades too, like 2.5 gig networking. Turning the build on, you can see that both memory modules are detected fine, and I have XMP applied. I have now done a fresh install of Windows 11, and installed all of the Windows updates and necessary drivers. For RGB, I've installed Aorus's RGB Fusion 2.0 and this controls the motherboard, memory, case, and fan lighting. But it wouldn't detect the GPU, which is a shame, as that means I also need InnoFreeD's TuneIt software too. This isn't too much of a problem, because it seems that once you select a colour for the GPU and applied it, you can then disable TuneIt from starting with Windows, and the colour you've picked will remain. Fan speed is something that I really like to dial in for the right balance between noise and performance. And I recently discovered the epic Remy's Fan Control program, so I'm going to be using that, as it's better than what Ioris gives you. I have this set so that the CPU cooler has a fan curve based on the CPU temps as per usual, but with the front and rear fans, they'll either match the CPU cooler fan curve ramp, or listen to a GPU temperature fan curve if the GPU is more in need of cooling. With the bottom fan, I sort of see this as a supplemental GPU cooling fan, so it won't even turn on until the GPU hits 60 degrees, and then when it does, you can't even hear it. And I only have this set to go up to 50%, because there's already an overkill amount of airflow in the case. Which brings me on to an issue I found. When using this system, I've noticed a cool breeze across my desk, coming from the bottom of the case, even with the floor fan off. So what's happening here is that these front fans provide so much positive case pressure that some of the air wants out immediately, resulting in some of that cool intake air leaving the case through the open grills in the floor before it's even touched a component and done any cooling. This isn't efficient and also means that when the floor fan turns on, everything will get really confused. So my plan is to cover this grid up, forcing more of the air to leave through the back of the case, as nature intended. I ended up cutting off the edge of an IKEA desk mat and taping that down from underneath. It would have been better to have used a piece of acrylic and made an actual false floor, but this gets the job done and there's now way less air escaping through the floor of the case. So the PC build that I originally received got a Cinebench score of 15,408. And in this new configuration, it scores 15,584. I also tested superposition. Back then, it got 10,949, and it now scores 11,061. But this upgrade wasn't about performance gains. The important improvement here is that Chris no longer needs to have his side panel off and a house fan pointed at the system in order to keep it cool. Also, that this build is stable. And like this, not only has it been completely flawless for me, but it passed 9 hours stable in ADA64. So, this is the final build done, and all in all, I'm really happy with the build transformation, except for how long it took me to film. Um, but I need to get this PC back to Chris, and I really hope he likes it, and thank you so much to him for letting me have his build for so long. But yeah, um, so let me all know down below in the comments what you think of the build now. If you like this video, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and you want to see more of my videos. Thank you so much to my incredible patrons and thank you all for watching. Bye bye.